Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the regular committee meeting of the Public Safety Coordinating Council for May the 13th of 2022. Ms. Preza, if you could have a roll call, please. As a reminder, when I call your name, please hit the button on your microphone so it's recorded for the audio portion. And you'll also be sharing microphones, so if you don't mind being cognizant of that, please. Ms. Julianne Holt? Here. Sheriff Chad Cronister? Major Tiffany Cole on behalf of Sheriff Chad Cronister. Chief Judge Ronald Figueroa? Here. Mr. Andrew Warren? Renee Mullen for Andrew Warren. Ms. Deanna Obergen? Major Ed Rayburn. Present. Chief Mary O'Connor. Lee Burkhoff for Chief O'Connor. Chief Chris Daniel. Mr. Nick Bates. Mr. Robert Parkinson. Here. Mr. Addison Davis. Councilman Orlando Goods. Senator Daryl Rousen. Ms. Kelly Hammersley. Here. Mr. Patrick Barantine. Ms. Patricia Candemo. Here. Mr. Mark Proctor. Here. Ms. Cindy Stewart. Here. Ms. Yvette Lewis. Present. Those appearing virtually. Judge John Conrad. Miriam Falkenberg sitting in for Judge, Judge Conrad. Commissioner Kimberly Overman. Here. Miss Cindy Grant. Here. Is there any members that I called that did not announce that they were in attendance if they're attending virtually? Chair, you have quorum. Thank you very much. In your packet are the minutes of our January 21st, 2022 meeting. If you could review those minutes and at the appropriate point, if I could have a motion. I'll move to approve. Move to approve by Judge, uh, Chief Judge Ficarota. Is there a second? Second. A second. Thank you by Major Rayburn. Um, any discussion on the motion? Any additions, corrections, or deletions to the minutes? Okay. All in favor of the motion to approve, please say aye. aye. Anyone aye. opposed? Thank you. We have no old business, but under new business, we are going to start with uh, Mr. Parkinson, who is going to cover items 5A and 5B for us today, and then he will introduce our 5C topic. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, first item uh, has to do with the sequential intercept <coughs> mapping that took place on April 20th. Uh, the Board of County Commissioners uh, accepted a Department of Children and Families Criminal Justice Reinvestment Grant to support the Circuit 13 Juvenile Mental Health Court. If you recall, the PSCC voted to support the application in early 2021 and agreed to provide oversight and engage in any required problem solving on the project. On April 19th and 20th, the sequential intercept mapping was held to support the project and it was conducted at the Edgecombe Courthouse. The goal of the SIM was to assess our current system of care for youth with behavioral health issues involved with or at risk of penetration into the justice system. The SIM was originally scheduled for the fall. However, Department of Children and Families uh, Tallahassee Central Office uh, made an urgent request to expedite the mapping in support of changes to the Circuit 13 child welfare system. Uh, Chief Judge Figueroa and court administration stepped up to host the event uh, with the County Criminal Justice Office. Uh, Chairperson Holt welcomed the participants on behalf of our PSCC uh, and emphasized the importance of the work that we were doing. Uh, I just want to point out that we needed uh, to target about 35 key stakeholders, and we ended up having about 52 key stakeholders participate. Uh, interest in the exercise was, was pretty overwhelming, and we are appreciative of that. Uh, to ensure Hillsboro SIM findings were incorporated into the CBC, Community-Based Care Agency's resource development efforts, uh, the Department of Children and Families uh, dispatched their newly appointed Deputy Assistant Secretary, uh, Megan Speaks Collins, and facilitated participation of the new CBC provider, Children's Network of Southwest Florida's uh, Director of Utilization, uh, Ms. Jane Widmer. Uh, the USF and uh, the Technical Assistance Center should have the mapping and report work product completed uh, in the next couple weeks, uh, at which time we will be sure to share it with the PSCC members for their feedback and guidance. And of course, our goal is to use that mapping and strategic plan as a long-term strategic, pl strategic planning tool. So 
If that, are there any questions on that item? Anyone have any questions or wish to make any comments? Well, Mr. Parkinson, again, on behalf of all of us that are involved, especially in the criminal justice system and that were present there for the mapping uh, collaboration, we want to thank you and your staff again for the great work that you do, and we want to express our thanks to the Board of County Commission for their continued support of our problem-solving courts and, and their interest in enhancing uh, our court system. And so please pass that message on to everyone. I certainly will do that, Ms. Hall. Under 5B, we have the Tampa Bay Reentry Roundtable Summit update. Yes, on April 28th, uh, there was a Tampa Bay Reentry Stakeholders uh, Reentry Roundtable Summit. Uh, it included representation from the Hillsborough Ex Offender Reentry Network and PERC, which is their Pinellas equivalent, as well as the End Recidivism Project in Pasco. Uh, the goal of the roundtable was to discuss the challenges and resources surrounding jail and prison reentry highlight the importance of addressing criminogenic needs, including enhancing educational and vocational achievement. Uh, the group asks that I keep the PSCC informed of their efforts, hence the update. Our state attorney, Andrew Warren, provided the keynote addre address, and I was the moderator for the event. We had outstanding interest and engagement for that event as well, and it included about 200 participants. A stakeholder panel, including Circuit 6 State Attorney Bruce Bartlett, Judge Sean Crane, Circuit 6 Public Defender Sarah Molo, U.S. State Attorney for the Middle District Roger Hamburg, Neil Voss from the Florida Rights Restoration Coalition, and uh, a few returning citizens who are now Pasco Hernando State College uh, students uh, participated in the panel. Uh, Mr. Warren did an outstanding job of conveying the value of reentry services and their positive impact on overall public safety. I just want to take this opportunity to again thank uh, Mr. Warren for his engagement. And of course, Ms. Holt, uh, you chimed in as well and uh, gave some very positive uh, comments on the importance of reentry in the community. Okay. Thank you. And I also know that Ms. Preza has sent out the uh, registration link uh, to the members of, of the council for the summit that will be held uh, down, south down in South Florida later on this year. And I would urge those of you that have an interest in this subject to consider attending uh, that particular summit. Uh, we continue to collaborate and coordinate with them, and I believe that the Hillsborough County Sheriff's Office is going to participate during that summit. And so they will learn a lot about um, all of the different progressive uh, initiatives that Sheriff Chronister has implemented during his tenure. Any comments, any questions? All right. Then, Mr. Parkinson, under New Business 5C, the 1800 Orient Road Project Behavioral Health. And uh, if the record could reflect that Mr. Bates is, is uh, present. Yes, Ms. Holt. Uh, there is a schedule conflict. Uh, so our health care services director, Gene Early, and our health care advisory board chair, Dr. John Curran, are, have offered to provide a comprehensive update on the 1800 Orient Road project on, uh, at our November 18th PSCC full council meeting. Uh, so I'm going to ask that we, we do place them on the agenda for that meeting. But I, they did give me a brief summary of where we are uh, to, to remind the, the board. They also forwarded me uh, the a PowerPoint presentation that uh, gives a fairly comprehensive explanation of what we're trying to do with the 1800 Orient Road project with the caveat that this is what was proposed two years ago and there's going to be some modifications as we go into the implementation phase. So in summary, in January of 2020, uh, the Public Safety Coordinating Council was briefed on an effort to develop a behavioral health step-down program at the former Sheriff's Office work release site at 1800 Orient Road. Uh, the program would target persons with behavioral health disorders who were being released from jail and lacked appropriate post-release treatment and wraparound services. At the time, uh, the County Health Care Services Department expressed a desire to provide funding for post-release services However, their funds could only cover the services and not the environmental modifications and construction costs necessary to convert the site to a treatment environment. Uh, the Hillsborough Sequential Intercept Mapping Reentry Work Group, which is co-chaired by Ms. Marie Marino with the Public Defender's Office, issued a report and recommended support for the program and related clinical practices. The PSCC subsequently voted to submit a letter of support to the Board of County Commissioners 
for the project and also offer to engage in any necessary problem solving to bring the project to fruition. I'm happy to report that on April 21st, uh, Commissioner Overman and the rest of the Board of County Commissioners voted to appropriate the funds necessary to convert the building for use as a step-down program. Uh, and again, our Healthcare Services Department has provided a PowerPoint of the original proposal, uh, which is included in your meeting packet. And I'm not going to go it over it verbatim because many of you were there for the original presentation. But note the concept uh, specifics are identified on page five. Uh, and we're looking at about 120 beds. That's going to add significant capacity uh, for the reentry system. And again, focusing on folks with those substance abuse and mental health needs that have been unmet. Uh, and the other issue we've had historically is getting, in, uh, getting folks into long-term housing. And we know that HUD regs uh, have, had prevented folks from getting on wait lists while they were in jail. And because 1800 Road is not the jail, we will be able to get people on wait lists for Tampa Hillsborough Homeless Initiative, as well as Tampa Housing Authority and the other HUD-related programming. So this is, this is really a game changer. And then I also want to point out on page six uh, the partners that were involved in working out this problem and coming up with, with a solution, including the Sheriff's Office, Central Florida Behavioral Health Care Network, Phoenix House, Axe, uh, Tampa Crossroads, DACO, now Cove, uh, Baycare Hospitals, the Federally Qualified Health Care Centers, Abram Ministries, and it goes on. This has really been a heavy lift. And for the board to, to reward those efforts with funding to, to execute the program is just, this is really moving the, the needle forward on, on reentry services here in Hillsborough County. And I don't know if Chairperson Overman wants to, to comment on this. She kind of uh, championed that effort uh, from the board's perspective. But again, major, major accomplishment getting this through. Okay, Commissioner Overman. Yes, thank you very, very, very much. I will tell you, this is a, this is a game changer for so many that are going back and forth uh, in and out of our, uh, you know, justice system. Um, and this is where an opportunity for true justice is for those individuals that have challenges to try and reentry. I'm very, very happy to hear this. It also is absolutely necessary um, in so many ways, not only because Transition and, and housing is, is uh, one of the key elements of having people be able to move on as they find success in managing their lives. But on top of that right now, we have such a, a <coughs> dire situation when it comes to available housing. Being able to have on-site support to make that transition possible will make all the difference in the world. It's not easy, um, you know, all of our, all of these partners are going to have difficulty finding places for these folks to live. Um, but with the support that comes with these, all of these players, um, we'll have at least a hope of trying to help them find stable lives. And that's critically important to their success when they make that choice to move in a positive direction. So thank you, Rob, for all the work that you've done. This is, this is impressive, as well as the support of the Public Safety Coordinating Council. And I'm truly appreciative of my board, the Board of County Commissioners, that we were able to actually make this happen. Okay. Thank you. Any other comments? Ms. Stewart? I just have a question. Harry Edwards, Rob, and Commissioner Overman. There, now it's on. Um, but I have a question on the project scope. So it's 60 to 100 days, 120 days length of stay. Is that enough time? My concern is that they're there 120 days. Is that enough time to get affordable housing? And do we have commitment from some of the affordable housing providers for um, access for these people? That that's would be my only concern and, and question, and have we explored that? That is a good question, and yes, uh, it is going to be a challenge. And yes, the right people are at the table to help with those solutions. Uh, Tampa Hillsborough Homeless Initiative is actually part of the Behavioral Health Task Force that has been working on this on the behavioral health side for the funding. Is it a silver bullet for all housing needs? Absolutely not. But we understand that the folks going through 1800 Orient Road are going to have a specific priority needs for housing and getting them stabilized on medications, getting them uh, through a period of sobriety is going to help with that application process. The biggest issue we've had 
with linking people to housing who are serving time in jail is that they can't be engaged in services while they're in jail. Uh, HUD doesn't consider that homeless under the definition of homeless if they're in a jail, believe it or not. Uh, we're not going to have those same restrictions at 1800 or Ant Road. So they'll be able to engage them and for those services that are paid for by HUD that require them to be homeless, that will no longer be a barrier. Uh, the other issue, and, and the Board of County Commissioners has been very supportive of this in the past, uh, Chief Judge Figueroa, uh, Ms. Holt's staff, uh, county staff worked on a jail diversion program, uh, and as well as the Sheriff's Office, I forgot to mention them, worked on a jail diversion program about seven years ago, misdemeanor jail diversion, and we really found out that we needed 10 secure slots to make sure that we had throughput because of this very issue. And the board turned around and rewrote the contract with the provider to mandate that they had 10 slots for people coming through that specific program. So we've got the right people. We've got our homeless services department director. We've got our Tampa Hillsborough Homeless Initiative that are part of this group that are working on implementing this program. So does that answer your question, Ms. Stewart? It does. I just, I would, I would, I would um, ask that we just monitor closely just with the way the housing, I know we are all aware of what the housing market looks like right now and it's no better in these spaces than it is for anybody else out there looking for housing, for rentals, um, for inexpensive singletons to rent uh, a one bedroom apartment is upwards of $1,700 a month right now. And so my concern would be that we just monitor what that looks like um, and, and that we don't have a gap, um, an unintended gap. No, I concur with you, absolutely. And, uh, you know, Ms. Holt's staff uh, also have a role on the executive committee of the Tampa Hillsborough Homeless Initiative. And I believe currently uh, Ms. Marie Marino is the chair of, that, of one of those committees that, that looks at this issue. And she has been vigorously advocating with Tampa Hillsborough Homeless Initiative to pay special attention to this target population. Uh, once again, they're going to be coming back uh, to this group in November to give a status update and a much more comprehensive uh, explanation of where they are today. Uh, because again, it was an or unexpected gift from the Board of County Commissioners that we would secure the funding to do this. So there's a lot of tweaking that needs to be done, uh, reaffirming some commitments that were made two years ago, uh, and then also identifying any new challenges. And of course, the housing market has only gotten worse in the last two years. So my guess is we're going to have to develop some specific clinical throughput for this target population. But again, when you look at some of the housing programs out there, when they see that they're a graduate of the Sheriff's Office in Jail Treatment Program or DACO or ACTS, it's much easier to get them housing than somebody who didn't go through a program. So. And um, obviously Jean Early, deser Jean Early deserves an awful lot of, uh, of uh, congratulations uh, and his tenacity on continuing on this program has been tremendous. Um, coincidentally at this time, Ms. Marotti, Ms. Uh, Marino, uh, Myself with the Sheriff's Office, we're actually re-looking at a lot of the agreements that we have on, in place as it relates to mental health and substance abuse, diversionary type of, of uh, programs in an effort to try and really uh, find out where more gaps might exist that we're unaware of. So you, there's a lot of activity right now among uh, the partners uh, to look at this area because we do realize the challenges that you've discussed. Commissioner Overman. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I'd, I'd like to address uh, Ms. Stewart's concerns, um, because I have them as well. Um, we are um, learning that many of those individual uh, landlords that previously were willing to accept housing vouchers, you know, through HUD, um, are resigning from the program. Um, I haven't monitored it as of yet, but I do need to reach out to Tampa Hill, Hill, Hillsboro Homeless Initiative as well as to our housing department uh, to determine how many we've actually lost. Um, I did meet, for example, uh, with um, McDill Air Force Base this week to address their concerns for housing for those that are, uh, you know, stationed here, have to come here, have to find a place to live. And of the 62 providers they had on contract for military housing, 
um, they had last year, or that number has dropped to 32. So they are they are on a, they have a waiting list of a, about 500 plus families that are unable to find a place to live and are living in hotels in our in within our area or very far away. I can't imagine, and when I, we're getting phone calls from tenants that are indicating that their landlords are no longer accepting, you know, either HUD housing or aren't willing to extend their lease or lease arrangements with recipients of, of uh, ERAP money, of uh, rental assistance money, even in spite of the fact that we have a tenant bill of rights, we are finding that the housing shortage right now is actually a crisis mode. So, or crisis stages, um, as as Ms. Stewart mentioned, you know, a one bedroom apartment or or um, you know living facility or or, or house uh, is at rates that are clearly unsustainable given the rates of of earnings for many of these individuals that are re-entering into the program. So, I'm, I'm working with my board to. Um, increase the uh, American Rescue Plan dollars available for housing, development of housing, any kind of special specialty type of housing that maybe we could create inventory, um, you know, for individuals that are um, having additional barriers to, to housing. Um, but I'm, I'm still trying, I'm fighting that ballot battle, so I'll, I'll keep, keep you posted. Um, but it is critical that we do everything we can to increase the inventory at this point. And if investing in specialty, specialty type housing uh, becomes the solution uh, based on what we're seeing with resignations from uh, housing supported programs for special populations, um, we may need to, I may need to get the Public Safety Coordinating Council support in some of those efforts. So I just wanted to let you know, it is it is bad. We have 0.7% of a one month period of rental inventory when normally it's six to nine months. So it's, it's less than a month before anything is available at all. And that's for a non-compromised population. So I, I just urge you to all, all to help me as best you can to advocate for as much resources as you can towards the housing. Uh, crisis that we're dealing with. I appreciate that support. Okay. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Mr. Proctor, sir. Yeah, this is a great program. I've uh, long, been a long time believer in uh, that. We talked about it a long time. I just, just, I'm trying to remember the placement. Is it mandatory, voluntary, or a combination? I'm trying to remember how that worked. Thank you. So the 1800 Orient Road is not going to be a locked facility. So folks will have to uh, agree to go there. Uh, but again, th these are folks that may be on wait lists to go to another program from a community provider. So you know, our, our goal would be to, we lose them in that period when they're on the wait list, when they leave jail and they have to wait a month, three months, six months to get in treatment. This essentially eliminates, eliminates that waiting period uh, where they decompensate, start using drugs again, decompensate, end up Baker acted or, or arrested again and back in the front door over at Orient Road. Okay, thank you. Any other comments or questions? Right. <coughs> Ms. Stewart, then, if we can, under 5D interagency data share modernization project update, ma'am. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so this is a project that um, uh, the clerk's office has taken the lead on, but it is by no means my project. Um, this project is all about um, how we share data among the seven criminal justice partners. Um, right now, there's a gap analysis in the documents that are shared, and we need to identify the needs and the recommended approach across all of the criminal justice partners. We've included identification of unmet needs and enhancements that we've been talking about for years. Um, my office went to um, the very gracious um, BOCC for American Rescue Plan dollars to support this project. Um, so we are in phase one of this project. Um, right now, the Sheriff's Office, TPD, the Clerk's Office, the State's Attorney, Public Defender, the 13th Judicial, and the Department of Corrections are all heavily involved. Um, in the timeline, we're about halfway through. Um, and I'm laughing because Ms. Holt asked me yesterday, I promoted someone who was very heavily involved in this project, and she said, now what? I said, he still has this responsibility. <laughs> it's only until July. He's not going anywhere. 
Um, but we hope to be completed with the gap analysis and have an executive summary by the end of July and then closing out the project. So yes, in your tenure, we will finish this project, Ms. Holt. Um, <laughs> they, right now we are on track to finish. We don't have any intentions. Um, they, they kick off the liberal budget, it's about $67,000, um, but we've secured enough money to complete the project. Um, all of your offices are participating, someone from your IT or your administrative staff, so I'm very grateful for that. Um, my IT team is leading the project, but really excited to um, have us step into a new century on share, how we share data across agencies. So thank you. She's absolutely right that I called the minute I heard that so she had promoted uh, <laughs> Mr. Rockamora. <laughs> And I said, what? <laughs> so, but <clears throat> I, I just on behalf of the public defender's office, the, the folks from um, the vendor that you've selected have been really, really great. They're so open to the full discussions and they, and they have a good grasp of and understand our systems pretty well. And uh, immediately, like we have a different case management system than other people and they told us we need to bring your vendor in right away. So I really see this as a very positive move and really looking forward to it. And um, it will, it will be a great, at the end of the day, it'll be a great, pro, a, a great project. No doubt about it. So thank you very much for moving that forward. I know the, the, the chief judge is excited too, I'll bet. I'm very excited about it because, uh, you know, data is, is so important to the work we do. We need to have the accurate numbers uh, that, we, that we all rely on. And of course, uh, hopefully this will be a model for a, something statewide maybe, which would be really, really nice. So thank you. Okay. Anyone else, uh, comments or questions? All right, then Ms. Stewart, uh, 5E, the Office of the State Court Administration and State of Florida Clerk and Comptroller's Florida Domestic Violence Court Information System Implementation. Wow, that's a mouthful. <laughs> is there, a, is there an acronym there, or something we can use for this? There is an acronym um, for that, I'm sure. Um, so our circuit was selected to pilot the Florida Domestic Violence Case Information System back in 21. Um, to date, access has been set up for five judges, a lot of um, court admin, along with team members from my office who work directly with domestic violence cases. The system um, is fed data from CCIS, which is the clerk's comprehensive information system, and all 67 clerk's offices participate in transmitting that data. The system allows um, a user to query statewide data on parties involved in domestic violence cases across the state. It provides access to the judici judiciary's DV bench book along with other valuable information. Um, <coughs> we're gonna do a little bit of a demo and I'm really excited that the chief judge is here because our, um, our current um, use of this is, is low. So we need to push this out to some of the judges who are duty judges for domestic violence. Um, I know we've done a lot of work in that space um, this year um, with me at the agency. It's, it's a focus of mine um, and I will continue to push the state to do more um, to protect these victims. But this is a tool that uh, I think Kamadi Yusuf is on and is gonna do a little demo for us. You are muted. You're muted. You think I'd get used to that by now. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. My name is Yusuf Kudmi, and I'm with the State Office of the State Courts Administrator. I'm the senior attorney um, on domestic violence projects. Uh, I'm excited to show you uh, what we've been working on. Uh, Chairwoman, uh, Madam Chair, uh, actually, there is an acronym for it. It's FDVCIS. I apologize for the mouthful. Um, it was hard to get an encompassing title. So that, that's partially my fault. But I'm gonna share my screen to show uh, the council what we've been working on. So as you can see, uh, this is the Florida Domestic Violence uh, Court Information System. When users log into the system, the first thing that they're gonna see is this homepage. This homepage shows uh, all of the resources that OSCA has, in addition to a side dashboard on the left that will provide them with the search tools uh, that Clerk Stewart previously mentioned. To briefly go over what resources it has, um, the first and foremost thing that we have is a, uh, a link to our splash page that basically explains uh, the different types of domestic violence uh, injunctions, uh, stalking injunctions, repeat violence, dating violence, sexual violence, 
uh, things of that nature. Additionally, we have case law updates. Uh, most of the judges receive case law updates via email regarding uh, any new interpersonal violence, family law, Baker Act cases. Uh, it's a, it covers a myriad of topics, but we also have a consolidated list based on month and year. So this will actually take them to those PDF documents if they need to go back and look for any case law updates. Um, as Ms. Stewart previously mentioned, we also have the Domestic Violence Bench Book. This is a comprehensive uh, guide to help judges that are either on the bench and are dealing with, with an issue that they're um, not particularly used to dealing with, or if they're new to the bench and just need a comprehensive guide on how to uh, deal with domestic violence cases. Uh, so it goes over all of the different types of injunctions, including Chapter 39 injunctions, um, a, a colloquy for injunction hearings. We also have a myriad of videos uh, done by, by multiple judges regarding various issues that would affect domestic violence. Additionally, we have uh, batters intervention providers by county. The purpose of this, of this system uh, was to give judges access to resources and cases that they wouldn't ordinarily see, uh, including um, it, where, where the respondent lives. So if the respondent is in, uh, in, in, in another county, and let's say he, uh, the judge is presiding over a case in Hillsborough, this will allow them to see batters intervention providers where the respondent presides so that the respondent can then have a list of those providers to comply with the court's order if the court is ordering batters intervention. Additionally, because uh, judges uh, rotate and because we do see judges uh, go to the uh, domestic violence injunction bench that sometimes are not familiar with domestic violence, uh, the Office of the State Courts Administrator teamed up with Florida State University to create an eight-module uh, learning, basically a, a, um, a learning study for judges to explore the dynamics of domestic violence, uh, economic abuse, uh, topics such as effects on memory, why victims don't leave, the dynamics of perpetrator, compliance and enforcement issues with perpetrator accountability, uh, domestic violence and animals, which has uh, become an emerging issue, and uh, secondary trauma and stress management for judges um, that are, are addressing domestic violence cases, because vicarious trauma does happen on the DV bench. Uh, additionally, we have additional resources on the website. These resources are uh, third-party resources on various topics, and they're, separ they're separated by topic. So if a judge on the domestic violence bench wanted to go and find out more information on human trafficking, they would click on human trafficking, and it would provide them with all of the resources that we've compiled regarding that particular issue. Um, we, we try to maintain the uh, documents on here to be no, no, um, no longer than five years since the publication date. So uh, we try to keep it as recent as possible. All of those resources are open to the public. Uh, they are on the floridacourts.org website. So that, that information is all available to the public and we actually push it out as much as we can um, whenever we have anyone who is asking questions. Even the domestic violence bench book, when I litigated uh, domestic violence cases, oftentimes I, I utilize the domestic violence bench book. It's, it's, a, it's an amazing resource. Um, I'm a little biased because I work for the Office of the State Courts Administrator and I realize that bias, but it is an amazing resource. But the real shining achievement of this system is the ability to look up participants and look for related cases. Now, um, in regard to the cases that our system captures, we only capture domestic violence injunction cases, meaning, I, I should say in the more broader term, interpersonal violence injunction ca cases such as the stalking cases, dating violence, domestic violence, um, sexual violence, and repeat violence. Those are the, the uh, cases that we capture. Uh, since the pilot uh, began, we began uh, working with the Florida court clerks and comptrollers to also obtain um, dissolution of marriage data, paternity data, and, other, and we're exploring other types of data to start collecting to relate these cases together to give the family courts and the domestic violence courts a, a clear picture of, 
of what is going on with any related cases that may come up with domestic violence. So without any further ado, I would like to show you a example of what you would see on the page. So uh, because of our data sharing agreement, I cannot show the council any actual data. This system is only designed for court staff, judges, judicial assistants, clerks, case managers, and court administrative staff. So for that reason, I had my, um, my information uh, consultant actually create a dummy case. Um, and he has a sense of humor, so he used Princess Peach to create it. So if I looked for Princess Peach and I didn't select a county, I didn't select uh, a case type, this is what would come up for, for Princess Peach. There are two cases. So if I, cl if I click on the user, it'll show me not only will it show me the information of the user on that case, it'll show me the case where that information was derived from, which is test case one. It will also show me a, any related cases that are related to that individual. So we use what's called a fuzzy matching algorithm in order to match participants to cases. The fuzzy matching algorithm goes based on the spelling of the name and the date of birth. Now, the system isn't perfect. Um, and because of that, we do have a percentage of accuracy that we use. We have a date of birth match, a name match, and then we have a total match. That's the degree of confidence that we have. However, this system relies heavily on that date of birth data. So there may be a case that shows up for an individual, but because a date of birth was not entered, we would not be able to capture it under the fuzzy matching. It would still show up in the system. It just wouldn't show up in the fuzzy mat matching algorithm. However, it, there are cases that we have... A, especially during pilot, I was contacted, uh, said this individual, I think this individual is supposed to be related and we would go in and look. And if they were, we would link them to, to the case. Um, in addition to showing the information of the user, if I go into a particular case, it'll show me everything that is going on with that case. So it'll show you who the judge is, the case type, the case number, the division that it's in, the parties, the um, the related cases that may may involve one or both of those parties, any scheduled hearings, and the docket entries. So with the docket entries, it'll only we were realizing that there because every clerk system uses uh, different docket codes, we are focusing on the docket text. Uh, the docket text will show. Essentially, the clerks are entering in if there was a final judgment or if there was a dismissal. Unfortunately, we're not able to capture the um, the documents as of yet. The only data we're able to collect from CCIS, from the Court Comprehensive Information System, is uh, the docket text and docket codes. So that's the, that's the uh, information we're able to provide to the courts as of right now. It's just snapshots of of what happened in the cases, what were the dispositions? Because oftentimes, especially in domestic violence injunction petitions, um, the petitioners will oftentimes note that in the petition that yes, there was a prior DV case, but they would not have the information of that case. So this system will allow the courts to find that information, um, to have a snapshot of what happened, to know where we are with the parties. And if anything was ever ordered for the respondent, if the respondent had VIP, whether or not he completed VIP from the previous injunction, whether or not um, there was compliance with it. Um, so that's what the, the participant search feature does. And the case search feature uh, does the same thing. Uh, it, it allows us to look up cases. Case search would be more case specific. This site itself is actually our test site. So it is, um, it's basically where we put the, the things that we're working on. Um, so one of the things that we're working on right now, um, I learned throughout pilot and after pilot, I got some really good feedback. I would like to take, take a second to thank Chief Judge Ficarota um, and Clerk Stewart uh, for their involvement. Uh, our pilot was actually with four counties and Hillsborough was selected uh, based on population size. We took two counties with big population, with large populations. So we chose Broward County and Hillsborough uh, were the two counties that we approached. One county with a medium-sized population, which we chose Monroe County. And finally, a county with a smaller population, which we chose Wakulla County. 
Um, all four county sites were, were fantastic. The uh, feedback that we received from Pilot was great. Um, but this arose, this was one of those things that arose from that. Mind you, this is a test site. Um, the images are not perfect yet. We're still working on selecting uh, images that will work well for this and making the user interface look a lot better. Um, but we've added external resources as well, such as uh, Florida clerk contact information. Uh, one of the things DB case managers were saying, well, what if I need information? What if I find a case and I need information? Can I have uh, the contact info for the clerk's office? So we we received we uh, grabbed that list from the Florida Court Clerks and Comptrollers website. Um, a list of Department of Corrections. What if the respondent is in prison and that's why he hasn't been served? This will uh, give the the courts a quick a quick link to check whether or not the uh, respondent is in prison. Um, a list of certified domestic violence shelters, as I'm sure everyone in the council knows, or most individuals in the council knows. Uh, the jurisdictional requirements or venue requirements rather for uh, domestic violence injunction is wherever the petitioner resides, wherever the respondent resides, or wherever the offense occurred. So that could potentially be three different counties. So if you have a petitioner who is staying at an abuse shelter away from where she, away from where the offense occurred and away from where she lived, let's say she lived with the respondent in another county, this will allow the, the court to give a list of resources, or rather she's not staying at a shelter if she's staying with a friend, a list of resources to certify domestic violence shelters. And we were able to grab that from the Florida Partnership to End Domestic Violence website. In addition to that, there's the Florida Domestic Violence Legal Hotline, another resource for petitioners if they need legal advice. Um, that's a free hotline that, um, that is, I believe, I believe the Department of Children's and Families took it over. There's also a list of law enforcement agencies. Some of the agencies on this web, on these um, sites uh, will allow a, um, an inquiry of the jails or an inquiry of uh, whether or not there is an inmate. So we have added that as well. Finally, the, the last four um, is a Florida abuse hotline. Uh, as we know, judges are mandatory reporters. So if there's any allegations of abuse, this will basically allow um, the courts to, re to report that, whether or not it's child abuse or adult abuse. Finally, we do have um, best practices for dealing with firearms. These were uh, added recently. Um, some of them, so it, it's just PDFs that list the statutory mandates regarding firearms in domestic violence cases. And the second one was a best practices guide that was actually uh, created by Judge um, Amy Karen from the um, 11th Circuit. That and there's a disclaimer there that it you know it may change from time to time, uh, but it basically just gives some procedure as to what a court can do to deal with uh, firearms in domestic violence cases. But that is the system as it stands right now. Um, we were very fortunate. Uh, I, I applied for a, a grant for improving criminal justice response to domestic violence uh, last year, and we were awarded a four year grant. So this project is actually going to be funded for the next four years to continue to be improved. So this is just the beginning. So th the biggest plea that I can make to Chief Judge Ficarota and um, Clerk Stewart is um, please encourage your court staff, please encourage your judges to keep using it. Um, there has been uh, some some um, utilization by by uh, Hillsborough County. I did receive really good feedback from Hillsborough, and I'm so grateful for that. But the more feedback we get, the better the improvements we can make to this system. Um, if anyone has any questions, I am I am available to ask answer them. Are there any questions? I see Commissioner Overman has her hand up. Absolutely, I do. Um, I am very excited to see the project you're working on and um, see significant overlap when it comes to the dependency court and, and the and DCF's uh, effort to um, address children's placement as well as you know where they are in transitioning and getting permanency. When we recently looked at a great deal of uh, data on um, children that either enter were at risk of entering the system or were in the system, uh, in the dependency court system, they uh, we found that 
um, ninety percent of the cases, if not ninety-five percent of the cases, had incidences of either gun violence or domestic violence. Um, so it is a key indicator of uh, the cause, oftentimes, of a child to be removed or be at risk or addressing the issues association associated with um, the reunification and, and the counseling that's needed. So having the domestic violence court have this information is valuable, but having the dependency court have access to this information specifically is critically important, given that there's an overlap that is pretty consistent here in Hillsborough County. That will be very important now that the courts are have, have moved from DCF employing the state attorney's office as their legal support um, to doing it themselves. So making sure that DCF is well aware of that as we also are in the process and working with the transition team for bringing on a new lead manager uh, with those that are caring and, and tracking the system. Because we're interested in actually creating a similar model for the dependency system where all the parties that are involved in the dependency case, including the placement, the parents, law enforcement, case managers, transportation people, the guardian ad litem, the whole nine yards would have at least some access to some of the information to be able to find permanency for this for the children as quickly as possible. So it's critically important. The other court that I'm very interested in is, as you mentioned earlier, is the human trafficking. Um, there is a lot of overlap with the dependency court, with the drug court, with, uh, you know, with law enforcement and domestic violence in the in the world of human trafficking. And so being able to help a, a human trafficking victim um, escape their trafficker, you know, a domestic violence case needs to be opened, but it may not work that way when they're desperately afraid of actually the risk associated with getting into that domestic violence situation and notice and all those kinds of things. So, um, we do have a court liaison that the Human Trafficking Commission actually funded through the court system. And so making sure that person has access to that as they're looking at cases so they can see what cases are out there and then and map uh, either resources or other issues uh, that can be, come into play with human trafficking, assuming that they're identified as such. But any case, having that person know, look at cases that are coming through to be able to see some of the trends that we frequently see with human trafficking, identifying those cases and other related cases will probably help us further explore where human trafficking is evident to the system, but may not be necessarily evident in our um, in the legal system yet. Um, there's a correlation there, but it may not necessarily be obvious. So I truly appreciate the work that you're doing. Look forward to working with you on the related sort of projects that we've got going on, because I can see, as we've discussed before, the the intercept map shows that oftentimes with adults, you know, that it impacts um, you know, domestic violence, it impacts mental health, it impacts uh, human trafficking, and it impacts the DCF system. So they are oftentimes interrelated issues, and I appreciate the work that you're doing. Looking forward to seeing this work within the for the judges so that they have an understanding of those, those elements and where the challenges and opportunities for correcting the situation can occur. Thanks. Thank you, Commissioner. Well, are all 67 counties already in this, or are you putting them in slowly? And uh, is it up and running for just the 13th Judicial Circuit? And who can access access these, this information? Mm -hmm. These are all great questions. Thank you so much. Um, first of all, <laughs> yes, it is up and running. The system is actually a web-based system, um, so it's just a website. Uh, the judges would just navigate there and judges, court staff, clerks would navigate there after they're provided access. And it's done through the Active Directory. So, so long as they have an Active Directory account, uh, they would be able to access it once we provide them access. 
users are typically asked to um, send in a user access form. The reason why is we capture certain data so we can tailor the site to them. We are working on making improvements to the site, as I previously stated, um, including making a dashboard page so that when a judge logs in or, or a judge logs in or a judicial assistant logs in, the judge can see their docket for that day or see the docket for the previous day. The way our system works is that it captures it on a nightly basis. We get a nightly data upload and the data comes, the data that we've received goes all the way back to 2016. So we went five years back from when we first started this project. Um, additionally, uh, in regards to those that can access the site, uh, because of the data sharing agreement we currently have in place, it is only for court staff, only for judges, only for judicial assistants, clerks, administrative staff. Unfortunately, the, the system is not available to the public, um, it, and it's not going to be uh, something that we make available to the, to the public for the foreseeable future. But it is, as of right now, it's already available to the judges. All they have to do is uh, request access. Uh, and when I say judges, I, I should say judges, court staff. Uh, I, I, I mean to include all of the members of the judiciary and the clerk staff as well. Um, it's open to uh, all of them. They just send a user access form to our website, which I can make that available to Chief Judge Ficarota, or uh, I believe I can uh, send it to Miss Justice, um, just in case anyone in the court staff who has not had access to it would like access to it. Um, they fill out a user access form, they send it to us, we open their account. That would be great. Um, and I'll, I'll follow up with Gene on that. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Judge. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, I just wanted to say, I mean, I am really impressed with what that office, what your offices did and, and the website. And I, I want to encourage Judge Figueroa to um, encourage more judges to use this because I think that would cut down on a lot of the conversations and a lot of the calls that come through our office that will help service the community better. So this is a wonderful project, and, and, and I look forward to um, getting finding out more about it and help educating the people that need to be educated. And like I say, um, because, you know, we get uh, calls on judges as well, so I think this would cut down our calls. So thank you for this project, this program. Thank you. I just wanted to thank Yusuf for, for the presentation and the work and commitment that he has uh, exhibited on this project. Uh, it, many of you recall that Ms. Holt challenged a number of us to advance the domestic violence system about three years ago, four years ago, uh, which resulted in us working together on a Office of Violence Against Women grant, which we received, and we've been providing some fairly significant upgrades to the clerk's office and the spring of Tampa Bay on the training side, on the data side. We are very, very lucky. Yousef comes from our area. Uh, Yousef used to be an attorney for the spring, so he has the expertise, uh, and he's been leading the charge up there. But Yousef is also a member of our Domestic Violence Task Force here in Hillsborough County, so he has kept us informed of this effort uh, as it's been developing. To be honest with you, I thought it was such a Herculean task that I wouldn't see it in my lifetime. Uh, and when he, he, he came to us and said, it's done, we're ready, we're moving forward on it, we were all just blown away. And he gave a presentation to the task force, I believe it was last week. And, uh, you know, if our expectation was a three, he, he delivered with an 11. Uh, you see the value that, that the, the data provides, but also the resources to the judiciary uh, and eventually the community, too, with some of those training modules. Just absolutely incredible. And uh, when we started on this endeavor, uh, Ms. Holt challenged me to go sit in DV court for a few days, and I did. And this is going to solve a number of the issues that we observed and, of course, then codified in our OVW grant. So thank you, Yousef, for this. Uh, you've been partnering with us. You've been a member of the task force. But we didn't have to pay you to do it. So thank you for that. <laughs> really appreciate your commitment to the target population. Thank you, Mr. Parkinson. Today's, today's present. Yeah, I muted myself. Uh, today's today's presentation really does show how technology really can, uh, if you put your mind to it, can really expand itself and can really enhance 
uh, not only the court's uh, knowledge of, of, of its participant parties, but really um, ensure that there are no gaps as we go through, whether it's the child welfare system, the criminal justice system, whatever system we're in, you know, we should really know what's going on with these individual parties that are in front of us and what the dynamics of, of their family life is. And that would, that would help us navigate better not only that particular case, but navigate better the outcomes for that, for that particular case and those individuals. So it is amazing what technology can do, Judge. And, she, you know, to you and to Ms. Stewart, congratulations. I always love it when Hillsborough County is at the forefront. Yusuf, thank you very much. You've done a great job. Does anyone else want to comment? Mr. Parkinson, sir. Just wanted to also recognize a couple other people who have committed to this project, and although some of them won't have access to the data, they realize the value, and that is Ms. Uh, Tennille Ms. Lickley, Ms. Lickey with the Spring of Tampa Bay, uh, Ms. Jen Kaufman with the uh, State Attorney's Office, uh, and then, of course, Mr. Doug Bakke, who works for Ms. Stewart, who really helped keep this project moving forward. I saw Ms. Moratti taking down some copious notes. I'm sure we're going to figure out how we can get access to the state attorney's office since they're at that front line every day, first thing in the morning. Um, and it's, it's always helpful for them when they're trying to work out whether they're going to negotiate a case or not. The more knowledge they have, number one, the sooner that they can resolve cases. So we look forward to uh, this continuing to move forward. Thank you so much, everyone. All right, then. Any other business to come before this council, Ms. Stewart? Thank you. I just have one other announcement, and it kind of goes along with this. Um, we have recently changed our jury summons forms, and as of <clears throat> June 6, 2022, now a juror who comes into um, the courthouse can now select to donate their daily stipend that they get, the $15, to either the Spring of Tampa Bay or to Voices for Children, which is the Guardian Ad Litem program. So that change is coming. Nice. Um, we're really excited to partner with those two agencies. A lot of people feel like the $15 barely covers their gas and parking for the day, which we cover their parking already. But um, it's a great way for us to give back to the community and, and for the community actually to participate in that. So I'm excited to announce that we'll be coming starting June 6th. Well, and I'm going to echo Ms. Lewis's uh, comments. Uh, you have hit the, the ground running since you became the clerk. and. Um, a lot of things that we've talked about are really coming to fruition. Uh, great, great timing. Uh, your energy level is outstanding. You understand the needs. Um, and uh, you're probably working about 20 hours a, a day from what I can tell. So congratulations to you and your staff. And congratulations to everyone that you announced promotions to over the last couple of weeks. Uh, a lot of those folks are, are people that we have worked with for a long time. They were very deserving and meritorious, and it's very nice of you to acknowledge um, their good work and their efforts for these years. So congratulations to you, Ms. Stewart. Any other comments, public comment at this time? At our executive meeting for the Public Safety Coordinating Council, uh, we took a moment of silence uh, because one of the individuals that we always had public comment from was Al McRae, who has passed away. And so if we could have a moment of silence at this time, uh, I would greatly appreciate it. Thank you very much. All right, then. Chief Judge uh, Vicarota moves that we adjourn so that he can go to his docket. Yes, sir. And enjoy that, Judge. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>